Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. So today we are talking about Louis Sullivan again. Uh, it's always, always amazing uh, talking about Louis Sullivan. It's always very exciting and very difficult because Louis Sullivan has been such a big influence on me. Um, and it's very easy for me to underestimate what it takes to communicate his ideas. So I have, I have cheated and I've always, I've gotten Sherry Trasinski with me who makes it a lot easier for, for me to uh, communicate um, because she can call me out when I'm not clear and she can add details um, and um, which really can show how these ideas are applied. So we're going to do this. Um, we, the last meetup we did was a meetup introducing Louis Sullivan's ideas. So first thing I'm going to do is that I'm running, I'm going to start a poll, uh, starting it now. Uh, so let us know if you attended the meetup or watched at least part of the video. If you have done that, then say yes, otherwise say no. So that way I can, we can calibrate our presentation. So we got uh, 13 votes out of 27. I'll give another maybe about 20, 30, 20 seconds for people to vote. Please go ahead and let us know whether you attended the meetup or watched the video. If it is yes, if you've done either of them, even if you watch part of the video, you can say yes. And if you have not, just say no, so that that way we will calibrate it. All right, uh, so we got about 21 votes. So let me go ahead and uh, share the results here. All right, Sherry. So it's you, can you see the results? Um, it's no. fifty fifty. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's that's what we have to work with. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a very short introduction. This is especially for people who have not uh, seen the introductory video. So don't 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 uh, don't be disappointed. I mean, if you had seen the video, you would have gotten twice the value, but this is a lot of value. So you will get a lot anyway. And we are, we are going to try to make this self-standing, but I would, if you think that this meetup is useful, please go ahead and watch the previous video because that really establishes how Louis, it's basically Louis Sullivan's metaphysical approach, you know, how he looks at the world and then you can understand this is what we're talking about today. Every problem contains and suggests its own solution. It is an epistemological point. It's how do you, how do you think? Okay, what we have talked about earlier is a metaphysical point. It's like, what, what is the world like? Um, so I'm going to very briefly summarize. And then uh, Sherry, you can add to it uh, if you want. But what we're trying to say, okay, how is, the worldview of Louis Sullivan different than the most prevalent views today. So if I had to summarize that, is that the two most prevalent views are one is I would generally, I would call it platonic view, which is folk, which thinks that there are actual ideas out there at, at the extreme of it. Uh, that ideas are already there and it's all about get, you're getting direct insight into the ideas. The second view is a subjectivist or materialistic view where you hold that the world is just, you know, multitudinous. It has just parts and there are different feelings that you get from it. You can't really put it together in any way. So it's all, you know, whatever happens, happens or whatever you see, that's all you can, you can't do anything else with it. So it's kind of like, a, it's like many and one, so it's like only one exists or only many exist. Um, what Louis Sullivan's view is to, it, he looks at the world very differently. The Platonist starts with, start with ideas and the subjectivist or the materialist just focus on uh, details of experience. That's it. What he does is that his concept is, I mean, he uses the concept life but it's equivalent to reality or existence itself. So he says there is life, life just is. And what consciousness does, what we do is to try 
to understand life. You try to take in life, be open to life, watch its rhythms, watch its ups and downs, watch uh, everything, observe everything about it, and then in, act in accordance with that. So our consciousness is limited. We have to be open to life and take in everything connected with life and act in accordance with that. So it's a very inductive approach. It is very much focused on the world and it is a inductive approach. So that's how uh, it is different. That's a very brief way of putting it. Uh, Sherry, would you like to add anything to it? I think that's a good summary actually. Um, I think that's a good starting block for where we're gonna be going here. Okay, very good. So that's where, I, again, I really recommend those who have not seen the video or uh, even those who have seen the video to see the previous one, uh, previous video, because there we do a very detailed job of showing what that approach means uh, for, you know, for it's like a two hour piece uh, covering different angles of it. So that's what I would recommend. Now, the good thing is that Originally we started, we said, okay, we managed to, I think we did a decent job because normally my record has been, if I try to talk to hundred people, I managed to communicate this to two people. But I think last time there were about 50 people and at least like seven or eight people got significant stuff from it uh, up to a point like Sherry's parents watched it and they drove all the way to the nearest bank for several hours to see the, you know, Louis Sullivan bank. So that, that's, that's better, you know, I, I give most of the credit to Sherry for that, but <laughs> uh, you know, for, for, for the you know, edit, edit communication, I think it works very well having two different voices and two different approaches to it as well. Uh, and the conversation kind of going back and forth and kind of correcting and amplifying all of that helps. Um, so that, that was pretty good. So what we're trying to do today is to show how his ideas actually can be used, okay? Now his core idea is form follows function. So at some point we'll have to do that, okay? And that is his biggest idea, but this is a core stepping stone towards that. It's kind of the same, it's in the same direction, uh, but it's a much more crisper thing, which I think can be understood easier. So that's why I picked this. So I said, okay, let's, so I said to Sherry, okay, now we have to delimit it. Okay, we have to, we can't be talking for that long. Um, this time we are actually going to, so I picked four pages. And then I thought even that was too much to be communicated in a single meetup. So I have focused only on one page. Okay, now um, I'm going to run the poll again, but the question is different though it says the same thing. How many of you have actually read this page? This is the page, you know, it, it goes, um, the, the first page of this. So let me go ahead and run the poll again. It's going to say the same thing, but let me know if you have read the page. Okay, let me relaunch the poll, uh, clear the existing, continue. Okay, I'm relaunching, just let me know. If you have read it, then just say yes. If you have not read it, say no. All right. I've read it. You have read it? Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad that Rob also read it. So that's, yeah. that's good. All right. So most people, I, I, only one third of the people have read it. Uh, let me just uh, end the poll, share the results. All right. So again, don't worry about this because I, this is all to kind of uh, just see where you are. So what I'm going to do is only one page. So I'm going to read the page, but I'm not going to just read it through. I'm going to read small parts of it and then I'm going to discuss the idea. So the, let me tell you about the structure of the meetup now. I'm going to read this page and I'm going to explain uh, what I think it means and what, and what method of operation Louis Sullivan is suggesting. Then Sherry is going to apply that method, the, the idea of every problem contains and suggests its own solution to one large example of Louis Sullivan himself designing the skyscraper. Okay, so he, she's going to show you that principle, how it applies to that work. So that, and then we are going to actually go into breakout rooms. I'm going to reduce his method through just 
three questions, which are there on the meetup page, three questions. So think, I'm gonna invite, and you can do that, you know, you can start doing now. Think of a problem that you would like to discuss, that you're prepared to discuss with other people. More important the problem, the better, okay? And then you are going to, each person will have a chance to pose their problem. They will have five minutes. So they will have a chance to pose the problem and then other people and let other people talk about your, the problem are going to apply those three principles, three questions to that problem. And let's see how much pro progress can be made in the breakout room. It's only 25 minutes. Each person gets about five minutes, whatever time is, if there is any time left. You don't have to, uh, you know, it's, it's, I recommend uh, posing a problem, but it's not, uh, necessary. It's not mandatory. It's optional. It's up to you whether whether you do it or not. I would recommend doing it because you will get more value out of it. And then after breakout rooms, you're going to come back. We're going to discuss your experience of applying this principle in this way. And then we are going to uh, see the patterns that come out of that. And we are going to address those patterns. So that's what we're going to do. So it's a very, it's, a, it's we're trying to actually try to show how to apply this principle okay and let's see let's see how it goes all right before so, you start before you sure. start i think um since only about 50 percent of the people have read it it might be good to take just two minutes to say what kindergarten chats is very good so oh, please uh sherry that great see that, that's why i have you here uh <laughs> so please tell a little bit about louis okay. sullivan so because half the people may not be familiar with it okay. talk a little bit about you know about five minutes about louis sullivan about uh, maybe a couple of minutes about kindergarten chat and then hand it over to me. Okay. Thank you. So Louis Sullivan um, was an architect, very prolific architect in Chicago around the turn of the, of the 20th. Okay, I'm going to get my numbers off here. From He was uh, operating in Chicago in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, really one of the founding fathers of modern architecture. Um, and his idea of form follows function is really uh, the underpinning behind a lot of the ideas of modern architecture that have grown from that, although they don't seem like it when you at first look at it. Kindergarten Chats was um, a book. It's, it first came out as a, uh, as a series of articles in a magazine and later put into a book written towards the end of his life. And it was written in a style of a conversation between himself, the professor, and a student who had since graduated, had just graduated from uh, architecture school. Um, so he's referring to kindergarten chats as chats of an elemental nature. And um, the funny thing about the idea that somebody who has just gotten a degree in architecture needs to start at the very beginning is kind of, part of Louis Sullivan's sense of humor. So if you pick the book up and you don't know that, you, you'll notice it's, it seems like there's two people talking, that they're not, it's not like if you're reading a play, it'll say Joe, colon, and this is what Joe is thinking. It's, it just happens in a paragraph form. So sometimes you've got to wonder who's doing the talking, who's uh, doing the listening. Um, but once you know that part, the rest of it comes pretty easily. Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks. That, that was, a, uh, you know, I think I think that it's good to add at that context. All right. So I'm going to start um, start reading now. So towards end of the previous conversation that they had uh, the previous day, uh, Louis Sullivan makes this statement. He ends the conversation with this sen sen statement. Every problem contains and suggests its solution. Don't waste time looking anywhere else for it. In this mental attitude, in this mood of understanding lies the technical beginning of the art of expression. Okay. So what does this mean? Okay. What does this mean? Um, We'll come back to that. So let, let me tell you the response of the, the students. He says, the student says, 
you have the singular habit of assuming when you suddenly make a compact statement, novel in character, that I'm capable of digesting it at once. For instance, I'm still puzzling over your statement uh, yesterday that every problem contains and suggests its own solution and that to seek the solution elsewhere is a waste of time. Now, I can't see that the problem contains its solution. Still less can, can I see that it uh, suggests it. I, so Louis oh, Sullivan says, I, I admit the impeachment. Uh, it is likely to happen when one has given years of thought to a particular subject that his working idea concerning it is apt to concentrate into a statement so terse that while axiomatic to oneself, it is not self-evident to others. The student says, that is just where I stand. It is not self-evident to me at all. My training tended the other way. And yet the suggestion excites my vivid curiosity. It sounds neat, if nothing more, okay? So now, Louis Sullivan uh, proceeds. So let me come back to the statement. Every problem contains and suggests its own solution. Don't waste time looking anywhere else for it. In this, in this mental attitude, in this mood of understanding, lies the technical beginning of the art of expression. Um, so let me, let me, the way I understand it is as follows. All he's saying is that look at the problem. Okay, focus on the problem. Now, what is what? So this seems like common sense. So a person can say, what do you mean? Of course, you, you want to solve a problem, you focus on it. But most people don't do that. Most people do actually three things, which are very different from it. Number one, they have all kinds of preconceptions in their society, in their culture about that problem. So they just go directly to those preconceptions. Okay. Number two, they have very strong emotions about the problems that they're working on. And they focus on the emotions, not asking the question, what is it about the problem? And third, they have done some kind of previous thinking about it. They just default to that. Okay, all these three variations are variations of not looking at the problem. So in another sense, this whole method is really the core of science. It's all about asking the question, what is it? What is it? That's it. Okay, just asking the simple question, what is it? That's what a scientist does. He doesn't focus on what other people have said about it. He doesn't focus how he feels about it. He doesn't focus, even if he has done years of work on it, he doesn't focus on this is what I think about it. He asks the question, what is it? If you do that, the problem, that, that's the starting point. He says that is the starting point. If you want to learn how to express yourself or if you want to learn how to understand anything, that is the starting point. So that's, that's my quick uh, take on, on the statement itself. So let me, let's go ahead. He let says, me stop in. Please, yeah. <laughs> so Srikant's a scientist. So he thinks of this from a scientist's perspective. I'm, as an architect, think of it almost equally in the science and in the art. Um, so I see the same thought he's saying, but from the artist's perspective that uh, you find the universal truth, the thing that you're really trying to isolate when you eliminate all of those external thoughts, um, other people's views, um, preconceived notions, when all of that is erased, that's when you can find the kernel and the beginning of the, of the solution. Beautiful, thanks. Um, so Sullivan goes on. Uh, this is a very interesting statement that he makes. I have come to regard as valuable those truths only which are universal. And it is a bit surprising to note how many truths are universal or maybe expanded into universal application. Now, this is a huge point, okay? This is, in that's, you know, this is part of the comprehensivist series that we are doing. This is the heart of being comprehensivist. What you're trying to do is you're trying to arrive at universal tools that you can use any, anywhere on any field. 
And that's how Sullivan thinks. Form follows function is the same thing. It applies to everything. And that's very powerful because most people you know, today think of all fields as being separate in silos. And they are talking, when they think about techniques and tools, they think about specialized tools. What this is, is this is, you know, his whole approach is about trying to identify universal tools. Um, and that is a heart, which for me, uh, that is the heart of being a comprehensivist, of being able to go across fields and bring all that you learn to bear on any particular problem that you're working on. Sherry, would you like to add anything? I think that was beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's, let's continue further. Now he comes back after making the point about universal ideas. Now he's coming back to the core issue. He says, I don't suppose that anyone who succeeds in solving a problem really goes out of it for the solution. And this assumption, doubtless, also accounts for innumerable failures. And failures are certainly self-evident. The world is filled with debris of this sort. Okay, um, let me add one more thing here. See, one of the wrong ways in which people try to solve problems is that they say, I have a problem. And then they just go looking for tools, okay? And say, okay, maybe this will solve it. Let me try it. Maybe this will solve it. Let me try it, okay? So this is like you're taking something outside. You're not, you're refusing to look at the problem itself. And you're trying to go out of the problem and just picking up some tool to try to bring to bear on it. What he's saying is that focus on the problem and in paying attention to the problem and doing the work to discover its nature, that you're going to be able to find a solution, okay? As opposed to just trying to find something and trying to bring it to bear on it. Next one, particularly is this characteristic of intellectuals. So he's talking about, um, you know, people going out of the problem. Particularly, this is the characteristic of the intellectuals. The unsophisticated man is often better qualified to go straight to the core of the mat matter by a process of feeling to the sense of its reality. Okay, so this is again a very interesting point um, that intellectuals, again, this is a very much of a platonic fallacy. They hold ideas as being floating. They hold that ideas themselves have power. Like for example, in Louis Sullivan terms, ideas are patterns that he sees in reality. So they are connected. They are very much off life, very much connected with life. Whereas the intellectual tradition is largely platonic. And so they are just, you know, they're just taking ideas which are unconnected with anything and just trying to talk about it. Um, and what he's saying is that anybody who's, whose mind is not distracted by that, uh, what he calls an unsophisticated man, is able to actually see the problem problem correctly. It's a question of, you know, the idea of via negativa. Most people, it's not that they don't have enough. They actually have too much. They're trying to wear, you know, they have, their head is full of all kinds of stuff that they're trying to put on the problem, uh, which stops them from seeing the problem. Okay. Um, Next, uh, Sherry, feel free to jump in anytime, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, to give a very simple case, if you're given a peanut pod and the problem is to find the peanut, you simply open the pod and there is your peanut. The conditions are extremely simple, but the truth is there, the germ of a universal truth, which with sufficiently extended experience will formulate itself in an axiom or what scientists call a law. If we gradually enlarge our problem, we find its husk of conditions becoming complicated and its contained germ of a solution less and less obvious. But when we have 
solved our problem by confining our attention to it, we find the law to hold good. Again, it's a question of confining your attention to the problem itself. And this is the most important thing that, you know, which I get from the entire chapter, this following sentence. And when we have had further experience, experience, we become aware that the very nature of the limiting conditions suggests to us what must be the nature and the limitations of the solution. Okay, this is the most important sentence in the whole thing. It's by identifying where the limits lie that you discover identity of something. You know, what is it is implemented by scientists by measuring things. What you're measuring are the limits of things. So it's all about identifying the limits, measuring things. These are all ways of discovering the identity of the problem itself. Okay, this is, uh, so this is one of the core things that we are going to do in terms of exercises. First, we are just going to ask the question, what is it? And the second is we are going to try to identify the limiting conditions of the problems, okay? If you're searching for a peanut, you come to know by experience that you will not find it within a burr of chestnut. Thus, a given problem takes on the character of individuality, of identity, and you become aware that your solution must partake in that identity. If you come across a problem, and this is another, another thing, this is, um, this is again a counter to the platonic way of thinking where people just make up something in their, in their mind. And that to them has a real, quote unquote reality. And they actually attribute reality to that, which is actually a figment of your imagination. So he, he says, if you come across a problem which does not possess an identity, you know by such token that the problem is not a problem, but a figment. As the problem, so that this is another very crucial concept, that even to entertain a possibility, you need to have some basis. Coming up with arbitrary things from your imagination is an epistemological disaster because there are infinite number of imaginable possibilities. And if they have no connection with reality, then you're not actually dealing with reality. You're not looking at life. You're not looking at reality. It's not going to help you in action. So that is one of the catastrophic mistakes that stems from kind of platonic um, thinking. The last point here is, as the problem becomes more complex, it becomes the more necessary to know all of the conditions, to have all the data, and especially to make sure as to the limitations. So again, it's a question of uh, you know, limitations and depending on the problem, the kind of the complexity of the limits uh, keep increasing. So this is, um, would you like to add anything here, uh, Sherry? No, I think, um, I think this is, this is, I think we need uh, an example. Okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. So this is, I've just read through almost all of it. I, I think I skipped a couple of kind of side, side points, uh, but this is, this is it. This is all we are going to discuss. So now what we're going to do is that Shelley's, uh, Shelley's going to apply this to, uh, to one of the you know, large problems that uh, Louis Sullivan has solved. And then once that is done, then we will open it up to questions, make sure that the method is clear. Then we will pose, we are going to talk about what we are going to do in the breakout rooms. We'll get to ask questions about that particular thing, or exactly what you need to do. Then we'll do the breakout rooms, takeaways and the discussion. All right, folks. So keep your comments for, uh, and maybe right now we are just trying to clarify what this method is, okay? So now first, uh, Sherry is going to apply this okay. to Louis Sullivan's uh, tall building. Go ahead. It's not really me applying it, it's, it's Sullivan applying it. <laughs> um, so for those of you who were here last time, I am reading excerpts like last time from his essay, The Tall Office Building, Artistically Considered. But there's only going to be maybe two of the paragraphs I read that are the same as last time. 
um, and you'll recognize those, I'm sure. Um, because last time we were focusing um, on Sullivan's idea of form follows function, and we were using that essay as an example of that. Uh, this happens to be a very rich essay for studying Sullivan. So we can also use it for, um, as an example of Sullivan's idea of a problem contains its own solution. So these are some excerpts from that essay. Starting with, um, let's see. The evolution and integration of social conditions. He's talking about the beginnings of this idea of uh, tall office buildings. That special grouping of them that results in a demand for tall office buildings. I accept these conditions as fact and say that at once the design of the tall office building must be recognized and confronted at the outset as a problem to be solved, a vital problem pressing for a true solution. And now he gets into that problem that, as he's defining it. Let us state the condition in the plainest manner. Notice for him, it's about looking at the exact problem in its plainest, simplest structure. So he states this. Briefly, there are these. Offices are necessary for the transaction of business. The invention and perfection of the high-speed elevator make vertical travel that was once tedious and painful, now easy and comfortable. Development of steel manufacture has shown the way to safe, rigid economical constructions rising to a great height. Continued growth in the population in the great cities, consequent congestion of the centers, and rise in value of ground stimulate an increase in the number of stories. These successfully piled one on top of another, react on the ground values, and so on, by action and reaction, interaction and interreaction. Thus has come about that form of lofty construction called the modern office building. It has come in an answer to a call, for in it a new grouping of social conditions has found a habitation and a name. And then a little further on, he says, this is the problem, and we must seek the solution of it in the process analogous to its own evolution. Indeed, a continuation of it, namely by proceeding step by step from general to, specific, to special aspects, from coarser to finer considerations. The practical conditions are, broadly speaking, these. Wanted. First, a story below ground containing boilers, engines of various sorts, etc. In short, the plant for power, heating, light, etc. Second, a ground floor, so-called, devoted to stories, to stores, banks, and other establishments requiring large area, ample space, ample light, and great freedom of access. Third, a second story readily accessible by stairways. This space usually large subdivisions with corresponding liberality and structural spacing and expanse of, gas, of glass and, and breadth of external openings. Fourth, above this, an infinite number of stories of offices piled tier upon tier, one tier just like the other, one office just like all the other offices, an office being similar to a cell in a honeycomb, merely a compartment. Fifth and last, the top of this pile is placed a space or a story that, as related to the life and usefulness of the structure, is purely physiological in nature, namely the attic. In this, the circulatory system completes itself and makes its grand turn, ascending and descending. The space is filled with tanks and pipes, valves, sheaths, mechanical, etc., that supplement and complement the force or originating plant hidden below ground in the cellar. Finally, or at the beginning rather, there must be on the ground floor a main aperture or entrance common to all occupants or patrons of the building. And a little further down, he goes on and says, as I'm here seeking not for an individual or special solution, but for a true normal type, the attention must be confined to these conditions that in the main are constant in all tall office buildings and every mere incidental accidental variation eliminated from consideration as harmful 
to the clearness of the main inquiry. Hence it follows inevitably and in the simplest possible way that if we follow our natural instincts without thoughts of books, rules, precedents, or any such educational impediments to a spontaneous and sensible result, we will in the following manner design the exterior of our tall office building. To wit, beginning with the first story, we have a main entrance that attracts the eye to its location. The remainder of the story we treat more or less liberal, expansive, sumptuous way, a, a way based exactly on the practical necessities, but expressed with a sentiment of largeness and freedom. The second story we treat in a similar way, usually with milder pretension. Above this, throughout the infinite number of typical office tiers, we take our cue from the individual cell which requires a window and its separating pier, its sill and its lintel. And we, without much more ado, make them look all alike because they are all alike. This brings us to the attic, which having no division into office cells and no special requirement for lighting, gives us the power to show by means of its broad expanse of wall and its dominating weight and character that which is in fact mainly the entire series of office tiers has definitely come to an end. For in the hand of the architect now is definitely felt in the division position at once taken and the suggestion of a thoroughness, thoroughly sound, logical, coherent expression of the conditions is becoming apparent. Then he goes on about the architect saying that you don't need an educated, it can, doesn't need to be an educated, sometimes he often says, good education and architect is a bad thing. <laughs> um, he talks, he will probably tread, um, speaking of a, a man with a strong natural liking for building and a disposition to shape them in what seems to his unaffected nature, a direct and simple way. He will probably trend, uh, tread an innocent path from his problem to his solution and wherein he will show an enviable gift of logic. He continues on, we must now heed the imperative voice of emotion. So prior to this, you're sort of getting maybe what you're thinking of as international modern style. I mean, you can see where that germ of Sullivan's idea led to that, but here is where he puts the Sullivan part to it. So imperative in his voice, in his mind, the imperative voice of emotion. It demands of us what is chief characteristic in the tall office building. And at once we answer, it is lofty. This loftiness is to the artist nature, its thrilling aspect. It is the very open organ tone of its appeal. It must in turn be the dominant chord of its expression of it with the true ex excitant of its imagination. The man who designs in this spirit and with this sense of responsibility to the generation he lives in must be no coward, no denier, no bookworm, no dilettante. He must live of his life and for his life in the fullest and most consummate sense. Then he continues on, got it, this is just because last time we got into a discussion of other buildings, um, this is how he's not, because sometimes it's good to have a counter example. This is how he sees it as not functioning. Um, he's referring to other architects. All of these critics and theorists agree, however, positively, unequivocally in this, that the tall office building should not, must not, be made a field for the display of architectural knowledge in the encyclopedic sense. That too much learning in this instance is fully as dangerous, as obnoxious as too little learning. That miscellany, miscellany is abhorrent to their sense. That the 16 story building must not consist of 16 separate distinct unrelated buildings piled one on top of another 
until the top of the pile is reached. To this latter folly, I would not refer were it not for the fact that nine out of 10 tall office buildings are designed precisely this way, in effect, not by the ignorant, but by the educated. <laughs> so his sense of humor is coming out there. Um, and then continuing on, I'm failing because he's getting away from architecture and getting back to the root of this idea. Unfailingly in nature, these shapes express the inner life, the native quality of the animal, the tree, bird, fish that they present to us. They are so characteristic, so recognizable that we say simply, it is natural that it should be so. Yet the moment we peer beneath the surface of things, the moment we look through the tranquil reflection of ourselves and the clouds above us, down into the clear, fluent, unfathomable depths of nature. How startling it is in the silence of it. How amazing in the flow of life, how absorbing the mystery. Unceasingly, the essence of things is taking shape in the matter of things. And this unspeakable process we call birth and growth. A while the spirit and the matter fade away together, and it is that this that we call decadence and death. These two happenings seem jointed and inter interdependent, blended into one like a bubble and its iridescence. And they seem born along, the, uh, born along upon a slowly moving air. This air is wonderful past all understanding. Yet to the steadfast eye of one standing upon the shore of things, looking chiefly and most lovingly upon the side on which the sun shines that we feel joyously to be life. The heart is ever gladdened by the beauty, the exquisite spontaneity with which life seeks and takes on its forms in accordance to perfect responsive to its needs. Life is recognizable in its expression that form ever follows function. This is the law. Shall we then daily violate this law in our art? Are we so decadent, so imbecile, so utterly weak of eyesight that we cannot perceive this truth so simple, so very simple? Is it indeed a truth so transparent that we can see through it, but we do not see it? When our architects shall see struggling and prattling, handcuffed and vainglorious in the asylum of foreign schools, when it is truly felt, cheerfully accepted, that this law opens up to the airy sunshine of green fields and gives to us a freedom that the very beauty and sumptuousness of the outworking of the law itself be exhibited in nature will deter any sane, any sensitive man from changing into license. Where each and every architect in the land might under benign influence of this law, express in the simplest, most modest, most natural way, that which it is in him to say, that he may really and would surely develop his own characteristic individuality and the architectural art with him would certainly become a living form of speech, a natural form of utterance. So he's really talking about using nature as his example of how the problems grow from the very kernel of what they are. And that if you need to solve the problem, you have to look very, very carefully at what the problem is. Wonderful. Thank you, Sherry. That mm -hmm. was great. Um, so now uh, it's time for questions. So this time we are just taking questions about this basic idea that every problem contains and suggests its own solution. So it's going to be uh, Marco Mental. Montalto, uh, Jeff, and Deborah next. Marco, go ahead. 
Uh, just a second. I need to allow people to unmute themselves. Give me a second. Uh, yes, Marco, go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess my question was, like, in the example that, um, that you showed about the skyscraper, like, so what, like, what universal truth was in the, what was in the problem that he was, uh, that Sullivan was trying to solve? Um, it's, it's the beginning where he's talking about how the land prices are rising because um, people are moving to the center of the city. You need to put more floors in. The floors tend to be alike, but the downstairs are different. The very top floor is different. Those are the essentials that he's talking about. So what, what uh, Marco, what he's trying, what uh, he's trying to do when he's trying to solve a problem, he's saying, okay, what gives rise to this problem? So for example, he says, we have this phenomena where everybody wants to be in this particular city. You know, instead of being out in the prairies, they want to all come to the city. Now, how do you put so many people in the city? The only way to do that is to go up. And then he starts to kind of, so he's looking at kind of the nature of conditions themselves that led to this problem. And then he says, okay, if there are lots of people on the street, then what you build which is at the street level, should make use of the fact that there are lots of people on the street. Uh, maybe people can climb up one stair, so that will be affected by that. But all the other thing, all the other um, floors are not affected by what is going on on the street. So there is no reason for them to be different. So there is no reason to differentiate them. So that, this is the how he thinks. Uh, next up is Jeff. Uh, Deborah and Joe. Hi, Srikant. So um, I have this friend who encourages me to be uh, syntopical in my uh, evaluation. But, of uh, here we are trying to keep it short, okay? okay. We can do syntopical <laughs> things in the takeaway section. We will. So what I, what I hear um, in the answer there, Sherry, is that there, there's the question about what, what am I really trying to achieve? What, you know, and, and if I ask myself what I'm really trying to achieve, then I might be able to free myself from the only way that I know to achieve it and consider all, ki all kinds of other things. Um, and that is my experience in solving very vexing problems. It was to get tied into only one way to solve them. And then that doesn't turn out to be possible. And so we have to consider, okay, what is our hierarchy of the most important things we're trying to achieve and what might be options for doing that? Is that a little bit of, of seeing the, ant, the, you know, the solution to a problem from looking at the problem itself? I think that's a good description of it. Um, uh, go ahead, Sherry. I, I want to say something. I, I, you know, I, I can't, I can, let me just jump in and then I'll hand it over to you. Go ahead. Okay, um, uh, Jeff, that was great. That's a great example uh, because, and. What, what you said right now is basically what he's talking about when form follows function. He's saying, you know, focus on your function and what is it that you're trying to do? What is, what is the purpose of this thing? And if you focus on that, then different forms kind of suggest themselves. If you start by thinking in terms of forms, that these are the various ways I can do it, that's it, then that is limiting to yours being to actually able to solve the problem. So it is, it is kind of more, most direct application of form follows function, but it's the same, you know, it, this problem contains its own solution is another version of doing the same, same kind of thing. Sherry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I like to think of it some, sometimes um, almost like Darwin's theory of evolution, but backwards. Um, so we always think of it from what Darwin shows that um, the creatures develop to, to it, we, but we're seeing it from the, from today looking backwards. Um, think of it the other way around, like you're the little fish in the ocean trying to figure out how to get on the land or trying to figure out how to get to eat coral or whatever it is that you're trying to do. And, and notice that we see in evolution many different ways of solving the problem, but they all are at the very kernel of, at the core idea of what it is they're trying to solve. So when a parrotfish makes a beak bit, 
type mouth, it's because it needs to be that way to eat that particular coral food source. And when a lamprey eel makes a, a, what looks like a drill bit, <laughs> it's because it feeds in a totally different way. So when you look at it that way, that sometimes that is helpful for me to, uh, to get to the core idea of what he's talking about here. Uh, thanks, Sherry. Next up is Deborah, Joe, and Rob. Uh, Deborah, go ahead. Hi, I find this really fascinating, especially the, the writing that you're reading. Um, anyway, I'm reminded of Occam's razor, and that states that the simplest solution is usually the best one. So I think that Lewis Sullivan must have believed in that because that came from the 14th century. Yep. And then also I wondered, I wanted, this is my question. Do you guys find an analogy in multiple, or I'm sorry, in mathematics? So for example, addition versus subtraction or multiplication versus division, the inverse operation. So when you're thinking of the problem, you might think of it in an additive way. And then when you're thinking of the solution in a subtractive sense. And I think you just alluded to that, Sherry, when you were giving an example. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I also, I think of those as opposites, yes. I also think of knitting and purling as opposites. And they really are. When you look at them carefully, I've tried to teach people to knit and explain purling. And many of you may not have no idea what I'm talking about. So just hang on a second and you will know, we'll get back to something other than knitting. <laughs> but um, it, purling is exactly knitting backwards. Um, and once you explain that to somebody, everything else seems to make sense. But yeah, many, many cases, the, the simplest form that it takes, the, the more you're getting to the very kernel of the idea, um, for me, as an architect, um, I always know that a floor plan is right. And I often say this to my clients, well, okay, now it sings, so we're done. You just know when it's done because there's just nothing left to remove from it. Everything else is just as it's supposed to be and it looks all of a sudden like it was the simplest thing to do and it was extremely difficult. Wow, that's that's wonderful, Sherry. Uh, next up is uh, Joe, Rob, and Francoise. Joe, go ahead. Um, this has been really amazing and eye-opening for me. I, I, I thank you both for putting this on. It, it, it and I'm, I'm just I'm getting my head around the the whole concept, and it's actually starting to piece together. Um, the part I just want to make sure that I'm kind of getting correctly is the identification of limits in the problem itself. So then once in the, in the particular case that you're talking about us uh, with uh, you know, people being on the street and what was exactly the limits, like that was nature was, the answer was in nature as far as the limits were concerned of the current uh, environment. Therefore, he was able to then imagine a set of requirements from there. So the limits were turned into requirements. Is that a, a proper way of thinking about it or not? And yeah, thank you. Sure, you want to take that one or um, I'll, because I'll, you know, I'll naturally just take it right into architecture. You know, please, please do, please do. <laughs> this, this, that is very much your question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I take them as, um, when, I, when I'm working with a client, I've had clients, actually one client who was an architect herself and came to me and said, this is what I need. I need a master bedroom on the back of this lot that's shaped like that. You know, that was the slope. I need the, I need the laundry room, I need all this. She gave me all these, these details and um, in her mind, and she said this to me, I know it can't be done. There was her limit. And that's what stopped her from getting any further down that path. And so I, I said, da, 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 da. we don't talk about any limits on the design other than the specifics. Like I need this, the land is like this, the sun shines this way. Do they wake up early in the morning? Do they wake up? Those are the limits that are allowed. What we can't have are the limits that stop the thinking. They're like roadblocks. 
So we don't let any of those in. So you have to know what kind of limits are allowed. There are limits that, that, that are related to the problem and there are limits that you're putting artificially into the problem. So when you get rid of the artificial ones, then all of a sudden, the simplest, it's like pulling a little string, all of a sudden everything falls away. It becomes this aha moment. And sure enough, even on a crazy lot, we were able to get exactly what she needed. She just couldn't see that it was possible. Excellent. That Thank was, you. That was a great answer. Uh, next up is Rob, Francoise, and JB. Rob, go ahead. Uh, hi there. So in, in this discussion that he says about you look within the problem for the solution and not outside the problem, I'm trying to think what he means by going outside the problem. And I think what he's getting at, and it really comes across in the tall office building artistically considered, is the sort of phenomenon of if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> that people tend to bring their favorite solutions, their favorite way of doing things from outside the problem and say, well, how can I use this? This thing that I, you know, they, they don't look to the problem. They look to what's my arsenal of tools that I'm familiar and comfortable with and try to find a solution that comes out of their tools and not out of the problem. Um, now, I'll give a brief example, and then I want to ask Sherry about an example of this. So the, I don't want to get into politics, but you know, I, I have to, by the example that springs to my mind is the pandemic coming up. And if you look at the political debate on it, a lot of people like, you know, they're presented to this novel new problem of a pandemic that they're not prepared for. And I see a lot of people going to back to, well, what are the political issues that I like to, I like to be worked up about and how can I apply that? <laughs> yeah, how can I basically keep on doing the same thing I was doing before the pandemic and do it about the pandemic? So they come with this, you know, this pre, this set of tools that they have or a set of assumptions, and want to apply it to every new problem rather than looking at the problem. So, in Sullivan's time, and this, here's my question: In Sullivan's time, looking at the office building as a new problem, he must have had in mind the sort of the context of the historicism of the time, and people sort of coming in and taking their architectural assumptions from the historicists predominant school and applying that to, to skyscrapers. So that's why I would ask if there's some good examples there. Um, he really did. Um, and that's where, that's that one little line that I, I can't help but read where he uh, bashes on uh, the architects who do just that. It's, it's very funny. Um, but it's not just Sullivan. There was, uh, take the Eiffel Tower, for example, when it was being constructed, it was a new material. Um, and when new materials are introduced, that's what was happening with the skyscraper. It's a brand new material. We have steel, uh, eventually, fairly quickly afterwards, concrete. We have lots of new building materials coming up. And that was part of this too, that this idea of a brand new material, should it be used in the historic way or should it be used in a way that is natural to its own properties? And so that happened with, um, throughout history, actually, you'll see well, brand new materials coming into place. And that's why there are arches at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower. Yes, there, so there, that's the only element of, if you ever go, everybody's gonna have to go Google the Eiffel Tower or pull up your pictures from your trip. Um, every part of the Eiffel Tower is absolutely structurally required except for those little arches at the bottom. And the only reason that they were put there was to satisfy everybody's historical understanding of structure at the time. They were uncomfortable because it didn't, at that time, structures that big and open were arches because they were masonry. And so this was steel, it didn't need to look like that, but that was the one concession that they made to to make everybody feel comfortable. So Sullivan would have said, don't put the arch in, make it what it wants to be, treat the material like it wants, like its natural properties allow it to be used. I, I want to add one thing. I, Rob, that was a fantastic observation. Um, so another way of putting, another way of putting, you know, how people bring in things outside of a problem is that to focus on the problem is really to focus on a function. When, when, there is a, when you're trying to solve a problem, you're trying to say, okay, how do I make this work? You know, how, what is the function of this? Now, 
going outside, you know, kind of using something outside is taking a form which was designed for some other purpose and trying to slap it on to that, whether it is the architectural client whose preconception of how a laundry room needs to be is actually going to stop them from having a good laundry room that works. Uh, So it's like, it's those forms that are from outside of the functions that you're trying to, trying to solve. That's what is destructive. Uh, next up is Francoise, JB, and Leslie. Francoise, go ahead. Yeah, um, I I really like the, and I'm fascinating by the the problem, you know. But when I heard the solution, you know, I was looking on what really problem we were answering because it seemed to be a multiple of problems. All those uh, points, you know, are as much related to the um, growth of the population to the development of modern architecture, uh, to rural migration, to business development. So it seems, if I understand correctly, that the real problem to solve is how to express the problem. It's all in the expression of where we want to go. And, and in the case of architecture, it's, it seems to apply mostly to modernism, you know, um, and see in a futuristic way what the problem are going to be. But is it really an actual problem like we have now with COVID, something we never had before? Can we treat those uh, unseen uh, things which didn't evolve, but they came all of a sudden? Are we going to see them in the same manner? Okay, uh, let me- them In the same way? Uh, let, let me address uh, you know, the, the point about kind of the complexity of the problem that you, you know, he's talking about rural migration, nature of modernity, nature of architecture. When you look at his writing, you know, in this paragraph, you know, the, the page that we read, this is an example of a problem that has got multiple limits. So these are various limits of the problem. These are not kind of independent things. This is the problem that they are, he's trying to solve. He's trying to solve the problem of what kind of building should be done by an architect in middle of a city. And in order to solve that, these are the real limits. The limits can come from any field. It could be, you know, it, the, the limits can range from multiple fields. Oh, you, and you have to focus on all the valid limits. So for example, one of the limits that he brings in, which uh, is astonishing to people, is the emotional nature of human beings that the whatever you end up building has to speak to a human being. It must be something that it feels that when you enter the building, you have a certain kind of a welcoming kind of feel to it. And that's part. And now that is from psychology. Just like, you know, there is uh, construction, nature of technology. There is, so that is how problems are solved. So many, many problems are like that, and that's how we solve them. Uh, next up is uh, JB followed by Leslie. J- JB, go ahead. Yeah, this is probably a quick question I could have uh, in my uh, answer to the chat. But yeah, someone, I don't know who um, made a comparison with uh, mathematics saying that uh, addition uh, problems were um, related to addition and solutions were um, uh, to be compared with uh, fraction. And so my question was just uh, in, in this paradigm, what would be um, a division on, on multiplication, uh, if it makes sense? Uh, Sherry, if you don't have anything to say, I think this is a little bit off off topic. Let us let us keep it. Let let us shelf it at this point because that was a side point made by somebody. Uh, but Sherry, yeah. if you want to add anything, you are welcome to add it. But it, it's not like in the, in the main line. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, later. Okay, later. Um, next up is Leslie. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I was just going to um, interpret what Sherry was saying in her last long response, she was talking about building a house on on the the challenging piece of land, and it sounded it. 
and, and maybe maybe she explicitly said this, but but it just sounded like she was saying, we have to pay attention to all the limits in the problem. They define our problem, but there are no limits in our solution. And that the limits in the problem become some of the building blocks for our solution, but there are no actual limits on our solution. We will come up with additional building blocks also, but the, the key is limit the problem, no limits on the solution. I think that's a pretty good description, yes. And I find that um, that is, you, people are one way or the other. They are either willing to set those artificial limits aside or, or they're not. You can tell pretty quickly on, at least when I'm talking to a client, I can tell pretty quickly on whether um, people are willing to take that journey or not. And it's really, truly, some people are just not ready to take that journey. Um, there's nothing, the old, the, you can take them kicking and screaming <laughs> down that hall, but they're not willing to go. Uh, and there's just nothing uh, you can do to, I mean, it's a lot of, <laughs> it's not fun. It's not fun to try to take somebody da uh, unwillingly down that journey. Those are blocks, that, those artificial blocks that, uh, that that um, that we're talking about, they have to be removed by us individually. They can't be removed by other people telling us to remove them. Uh, okay, folks. Um, so what we can do uh, now uh, is we are going to now set up what we are going to do in the breakout rooms. Okay. Again, this is very ambitious. What you're trying to do. So number one, uh, all of these instructions are there on the meetup page. Uh, it's very simple, actually. Number one, identify a problem that interests you, that you're willing to discuss with others. So each person you choose, a, you know, I recommend that you choose a problem. This is optional, you don't have to do it, uh, but I recommend that you do it. And in the breakout group, group, each person will have five minutes. So somebody take, you know, somebody put an alarm on when, uh, and then somebody be in charge of kind of timekeeper. So each person gets five minutes, they post their problem and then let other people answer three questions about it. What is it? So the, now the beautiful thing about having somebody else ask, what is it? Is that they are not going to have the same preconceptions that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not going to have the same kind of emotional attachment to the problem that you have. So they may be able to point out something to you that will actually astonish you. Okay. So that's one. And then you can put your own, uh, you know, what is it as well. And second, ask what are the limiting conditions of this problem? And third, finally, you have to ask whether this is a real problem or a figment. What will happen, what might happen is that problem that you initially thought of will keep on morphing and become actually a different, you'll notice that it, it's actually a different problem that you started out with because all of it kind of, you know, it's, it was all kind of jumbled up. This allows you kind of to kind of separate things out. So those are the three things. What is it? What are the limiting conditions? And is this a real problem or a fragment? So that's what we're going to do. Um, so now, I would, let, me just say, go ahead. let me just say one quick thing. If it feels disheartening um, that you've discovered this problem you've had all this time thinking about is just a figment, don't fret because that just means you're getting closer to the heart of the problem. Excellent. Um, all right, so now uh, I welcome any questions just about what we are about to do in the breakout rooms. Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to start the breakout rooms. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and type in an exclamation mark. But questions only about what we are about to do in the breakout rooms. Okay, uh, Joe. Uh, so Joe and JB. Joe, go ahead. Just really quickly, can the problem be too big? Yes, it can be too big. Uh, but okay. we're going to spend only, even, even if it is the biggest one, we're spending only five minutes on it. Okay. Okay, so we'll spend five minutes and then we just go to the next one. But what we're trying to see is the usefulness of this tool. So even if you don't solve the problem, but if you have some really uh, good potential directions of how to approach it, that would be a big progress in five minutes. That's a good use of five minutes. All right, uh, JB, your question. Yeah, um, very quickly, um, what, what, what do you mean by limiting conditions? Um, are, are they like the limitation to solve the problem or? Uh, limiting conditions means 
um, basically try to specify what exactly the problem is and what it is not. Uh, what are the limits? We, you know, it can be usually pro most of the times problems as first stated are too vague. They don't specify things enough. Um, like, uh, can you can you give an example from uh, architecture um, or yeah. Sherry? Can you, um, where things are just kind of initially it is too vague and then kind of successively you start seeing limits? Yes. Um, often clients will say, I need more space. Uh, and then the question is, okay, for what? What is this space for? What do you need it to do? Where do you need it? It's all those questions that come after. So when you come at it with, I need space, it's not, it's too vague. It needs to get narrowed down. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Uh, they will run for 25 minutes. Then we'll be back here. Then we will, uh, each person gets to share their experience of doing these exercises. And then we will have a discussion after that. 